Michael Boyles, strengthcoach.com presents the Strength Coach Podcast, brought to you by Perform Better, the experts in functional training and rehabilitation, performbetter.com. All right, hey everybody, welcome to episode 280 of the Strength Coach Podcast, the official podcast of Michael Boyles, strengthcoach.com, the world's best source for strength and conditioning information, brought to you by Perform Better, the experts in functional training and rehabilitation. All right, I'm your host, Anthony Renner, and the show notes are located at continuefit.com. It's where I keep all my resources, and you can find out more about my book, Be Like the Best, and the Be Like the Best workbook. As a matter of fact, right now, you can borrow Be Like the Best, digitally, that is, because we know people are having a hard time, gyms are closed, trainers aren't working. My publisher, Laurie Draper, wanted to offer people something, so she ran it by me. I love the idea. You'll be able to borrow the book for two weeks digitally, and uh, you can read it. You can get it done in two weeks, no problem. So if you want to do that, send me an email to be like the best at gmail.com. Uh, just put borrow in the heading. That's be like the best at gmail.com and I will tell you how you can borrow the book. All right, today on the strengthcoach.com, Coach's Corner, I spoke to Coach Boyle about plans for reopening MBSC again. Hopefully uh, that's coming soon. Status on the stimulus package as well as the payroll protection plan, uh, how they are doing their remote communication and what he's telling his employees, how he's directing his staff. We also talked about Lee Taft's video for a single leg deadlift fix. For the results, Fitness University Business of Fitness Segment, I'm on with Alan Cosgrove to talk about reinvention. They've been talking a lot about that on their social media, and I wanted to talk to them about what does that mean and how do we do it. For the Train Heroic Data Driven Coaching Segment, Adam Doughty and Tim Robinson discuss remote coaching best practices. Remember, they got a 14 day free trial. They have new plans as low as $10 a month. So check out the free 14 day trial. Um, it, I'm telling you, I love Train Heroic and uh, I use it and I'm really glad that uh, I was prepared for when the crap hit the fan right now. All right, for the functional movement system segment, Gray Cook continues his six part series. Today in part four, he discusses breathing. For the body by ball online.com, hit the gym with the shrink coach. I mean, I have on Scott Carney. He's the author of What Doesn't Kill Us, which was basically the Wim Hof story. I had him on about two years ago, a year and a half ago, uh, when I read the book, and it just that book changed my life. So uh, this is almost like a sequel to it. It's called The Wedge. He has a new book out, and um, we spoke about what exactly is a wedge, how we can use it in training how our mindset for the wedge uh, needs to uh, change. Uh, his experiences with cold plunges, saunas, deprivation chambers, fear, flow, and so much more. This is a long interview. I love the book. And Scott had so many great experiences uh, to talk about in this book. So uh, this is a long one. All right, lots of things to get to. So let's get on the phone with Coach Boyle. All right, now it's time for the Coach's Corner with Coach Boyle. Don't forget strengthcoach.com, the world's best source for strength and conditioning information. We're also a resource for the COVID-19 crisis right now. we got a special resource page. We set up a place to view all the home workouts. We get a lot of great home workouts from people like Joel Jackson and uh, some guys from the Minnesota Wild and, and Brijesh Patel. Uh, Coach Boyle did a bunch of one uh uh, one by twenties on there. Uh, we also have a special COVID-19 forum, to, uh, just discussing topics like online training, handling memberships, um, and just really how to navigate through this whole thing and more. And be, it's always good to be part of a community. We did extend the trial. We're probably once the lockdown ends, we're going to go back to our normal one, but it's 30 days for a dollar. You'll have access to all the articles, videos, and programs and all, all the stuff that I just talked about. And the forum coach is on there every day, answering questions. You can check that out at strengthcoach.com. coach. How you doing? I'm doing good. How are you? All right. Hanging in there. Just, uh, you know, seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. So I'm feeling uh, a little bit more hope right now. Yeah, it does seem that way. I mean, it's really funny because Massachusetts is obviously one of the quote-unquote hotspots, nothing remotely close to New York. 
New York, they're saying, is already through the surge, starting to decline. I think any day now, they keep saying we're in the surge, we're in the surge, but we're not surging. We actually had less less deaths and less cases today than we did yesterday, yet they keep saying that we're in the surge. So I don't know. We'll see what happens. We need, from our standpoint, we need 14 days of decline. That's what uh, Trump's reopening plan said. So, I mean, that's two weeks from, you know, every day they say the end of the surge. So uh, I've kind of set my sights on May 13th. I'm hoping that's a Monday. And it would be nice for it to to time up and be a Monday and we can get back to get back to the gym and get things up and rolling. But and I don't know if we talked about this last time, but it's just going to be different. You know, it's you know, there's going to be limits on number of people. And I think we're going to have to wear masks. There's going to be a lot of stuff that uh, businesses in general, the things I worry about more, I worry about restaurants in terms of what are they going to do? Have four seats at the bar, six feet yeah. apart or, yeah. you know, four sets of two where, you know, you can come in with another person. but then you have to be six feet from somebody else. They're going to have to, like, you know, that business, you got to take tables out. Yeah, you can reopen, but, you know, your tables have to be six feet apart and, you know, you can't have more than a party of whatever. You know, there's just a lot of stuff. We're planning. And tell me if I'm repeating myself because I've done so many freaking Zoom chats and podcasts and stuff <laughs> in the last two weeks, but we're planning of being limited to groups of 10. Oh, wow. That's, you didn't tell us that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So that's what we're planning. And we may be completely wrong, but we think because, you know, that was kind of like how it was before they closed everybody down. And then we're thinking that they may limit us to the idea of 10 per room, which in my interpretation of MBSC, it's three rooms. So we could have 30 clients on premise at a time, but the groups would be 10. And that would kind of mean you know, issues with scheduling. People have never had to schedule before. We've never turned people away before. I think so there's there's a lot of things. There's a lot of bugs, I think, that still are going to have to get worked out here as we go along. Yeah, I think I was talking to my buddy who is the manager over at Evolve downstairs from me, and and we were saying uh, kind of like what you were doing earlier, and, and they did the same thing before, before you got shut down, was tried to show people, hey, we're going to do A, B, and C adding extra cleaning, adding certain things. What they did was they 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 did limit the, the group fitness. They made more uh, availability for small group training and move those people into those. They cut the number of classes down. So I think we're going to have to, uh, we did talk a little bit about this last time, but we're going to have some different things going on and we're going to have to show people that we're making effort. You can't just open your gym and be like, hey, look, we didn't do anything and we're back to normal because it's not going to be normal. We're going to have to show them that we're clean and extra. We're going to have to have those extra wipes there. We're going to have to have, you know, practice different cleanliness uh, uh, habits even if we were doing that before, we're going to have to make a little bit more of a show of it almost because I think people are going to right. want no, to. That's absolutely right. That's, and, you know, we went so far, like I was trying to get custom logo masks. <laughs> oh, nice. But they didn't have, but they were, they were too expensive because they would have been about 10 bucks a piece. But it's, uh, but we're going to, you know, we're ordering masks in case we're required to wear masks as a staff. And then if people don't bring their own masks, mask available for people uh because even i think even if they don't mandate i think there'll be people working out in masks like i look at people i'm at home okay buying materials and i just can't believe the number of people like i don't wear i'm just uh, which kind of me uh, i have not worn a mask but uh well we're required to wear them here here yeah 80 percent of the people in home depot have them on wow okay when and you're not required not required. Nope. Just aligned. Just natural. Wow. Coach, what about um, business-wise, uh, payroll protection plan, any of the stimulus? Do you guys, you not? You haven't seen any of that yet, right? Uh, no, we haven't seen it. We did not get in the first batch. And as I was, we were saying kind of off, uh, off the air, unfortunately, you know, we're seeing companies like Shake Shack and Ruth Chris and Harvard University and University of Massachusetts, they're getting stimulus money. They're not, I would not view them as small businesses. When they said this was a small business bailout plan, I did not envision, I did not envision that that would be, I mean, Cindy was saying Shake Shack gave it back. Shake Shack gave it back because of bad publicity. They didn't give it back because they didn't want it. 
And yeah. I think that's what, you know, and that's what's going to happen with Harvard. Like Harvard, I mean, Harvard has an endowment bigger than I think. I think their endowment is bigger than the GDP of 80% of the countries in the world. And that's not an exaggeration. It's in the billions of dollars. And they're out, you know, scrounging up stimulus money to, to help them make ends meet. Yeah. But that's what's yeah. wrong with, I mean, hey, you know, even when government's working for you, that there's still problems in government in terms of, you know, somehow nobody said, wait a second, you know, you, you know, you have to have under, I thought it was specifically like businesses under X number of millions of dollars in gross revenue and under a certain number of employees. But I'd have to think that Harvard's probably slightly over the number of employees. Uh, that- you know, what happened was I read the Shake Shack article and I guarantee you it was just a thing from the perspective of, because it's a pretty damn good company. Danny Meyer is a pretty honorable guy. He treats people amazing. I obviously was in that business and I know a lot of people that work for him. And and I can tell you that this was probably the case of having a boatload of, you know, they have a staff of accountants and lawyers and people saw it was it was it said 500 per location that if you don't have 500 employees at, at a location. And so that really was the loophole and there's no oversight. And so they, those people applied for it who, cause you know, Danny Meyer wasn't sitting around trying to, you know, filling out applications. They have people for that. And they thought they were doing, you know, they were like, Hey, we can do this. And so I don't, comp- and also to me, they're losing money as well, but it was a small business and they should have said, Hey, we're not small business. I mean, it's a big business, but at the same time, I, I guarantee you somebody down the chain sat there and said, no pun intended, who said, yeah, we can do this. This is we're we're fully into. And obviously there was 70 publicly traded companies that got the stimulus that are not really small business. So, so it is, it's ridiculous. And uh, I know so many people are struggling. Um, and that's, I think, what I'm hoping that, you know, the Trump administration will do is go back and say, wait a second, you know, we, we, you know, cause obviously this was all done fast and they should go back and say, wait, wait a second, you know, these, everybody figured out quickly how to bend the rules. This is not where the money was intended to go and we're not giving it to you because there's no way that Harvard and UMass Amherst need stimulus money. And obviously someone said, someone told me Boston University is going to lose $50 million, but they don't pay real estate tax. They're non. They're not. Uh, they're nonprofit educational institutions. They're not businesses in that sense. So they shouldn't even be entitled. But we could talk stimulus forever. I'm not. That's not going to make or break us. Yeah. We've got to be ready when, when the, you know, when the moment comes. We have to be ready to get back and be in business. Yes, absolutely. And stimulus money, obviously, it, the stimulus money would take a lot of the sting out of being closed for whatever it's going to be a month, six weeks, because obviously six weeks of zero revenue and the same expenses is significant. It would, you know, and it would allow us to get our staff back off of unemployment. But the reality is whether it's stimulus money or unemployment money, it's ultimately coming out of the same place. So yeah. it's not really, it's strictly an accounting trick that they use to shift money around. And, you know, for our employees, the the biggest thing for us would be the rent relief, because that's not, you know, we're owned by a big hedge fund company. I wish I knew the name so I could badmouth them on, uh, (laughs) you know, on the podcast, but I can't think of the name. Berkeley Partners, actually, I do know the name. And they're just freaking savages in terms of they were like, oh, yeah, it's really, we feel very badly for you. Rent is due at this time. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Zero consideration. But that's, you know, you know, that's the right. That's the rich hedge fund world in terms of it's all about making money there. You know, there's no there's no people emphasis in that world. So you just that's that's the unfortunate reality of somebody buying your building. Absolutely. Absolutely. Coach, you're still doing staff meetings. We've been posting them on body by dot com. So uh, the last one, I just want to I thought it was you made some great points about remote communication, what people have to really understand and, and that connection. Can you kind of go over what you talk to your staff about remote communication? Well, mainly we just talked about making sure you communicate because it's that, you know, it's that connection. Don't lose your connection to your clients. Be texting people, be emailing people, be, you know, Alan, and it's obviously not Alan Cosgrove's uh, term, but, you know, that top of mind awareness idea, you want people itching to get back to reestablish and rekindle that relationship that they had before. And obviously, if you're not trying, you know, it's out of sight, out of mind, right? 
what do they say? Absence makes the heart grow fonder for someone else. <laughs> and, uh, so that's we need to make sure we're, you know, we're there, we're there waiting for them when this thing is over, and we're ready to go. And they don't feel like, oh yeah, all of a sudden, oh now Mike's texting me. Yeah, he's open. He needs my money again. It's that, you know, and that's where, you know, the whole idea of us having the Zoom sessions and, you know, we've got, I think Bobby said last night, I think we have nine workouts a week going right now between uh, Zoom, Facebook, Instagram, actual live workouts where we have a trainer in there running the workout in front of the, whatever, the camera, the computer and broadcasting it out. So I think that, you know, we're doing our part as a business, but I've told everybody that they need to do their part as an individual. Absolutely. Good stuff. Um, Coach, did you see Lee Taft's single leg deadlift fix? I thought it was interesting. He did it. He kind of used the barbell to like holding the barbell on one side. So it was really like an offset weight. And I thought it was interesting because you just posted a couple of lever bell exercises. I think it would, and I tried it with the lever bell and it worked perfect. Yeah, the, the lever bell works really, really good. I didn't look at Lee's. I'm actually, I'm, I'm basically looking at the site right now to go back through because uh, I haven't, it's funny, I haven't spent as much time on the computer as I normally do because I've been working. So it's uh, it's interesting, but I'm, I'm pulling up Lee's video right now. So I'll, I'll comment on it in as many seconds as it takes me to watch Lee do it. Yeah. Oh, I see. So he offloaded, just you to use the bar, but offloaded it. That's a good idea. It's the same idea as Leverbell. It's just, and that's what people, it's really funny because when I posted that about Leverbell, people were almost, it was almost like, I don't get it. And, you know, you're kind of like, uh, it's, uh, it's called physics kids. And, and, you know, because, but it gets into that hip internal rotation thread and you start looking at, you know, uh, femur on pelvis or pelvis on femur. And what we're trying to fix in this one leg straight leg deadlift type motion is we're trying to fix a pelvis on femur rotation problem. And so a lot of people struggle with that. It's still internal rotation, but it's internal rotation of the pelvis against the femur. And what we're trying to do is get back to neutral. For whatever reason, people like to be out of neutral. They, you know, they flare out or kind of airplane out of that thing if you're a yoga person. And we're just trying to drive them back down in, but that's a pretty good way to do it. I hadn't really thought about it. Yeah, and and I I thought it was interesting, and the timing was funny because it was right after you had posted the the Lever Bell stuff. Did you see Tara Weaver's response? She posted a video as well. I thought it was almost like a um, like a bowling ball or a, a throwing a bowling ball, like but she reached over the side and and it kind of forced you away from that airplane and and forced you into that internal rotation. Did you see her do that? Yeah, and that's we do that all the time. We'll we'll like that's our kind of our standard like cross reaching. Yes, the reaching. Cross reach, like, yeah. yeah, I mean because the cross reach and that's kind of a you know an old Gary Gray type of thing in terms mm -hmm. of if you reach across, the reach will drive the internal rotation. And I said that people kind of struggle, but they uh, you just anatomically you've got to get I, familiar with the idea that either segment can move when the foot is on the ground, the pelvis can rotate on the femur. Obviously when you go to, you know, you go to cross your legs or to, you know, try to touch your knees together, then that's basically femur on pelvis, but it's different. Yeah. Um, and I even tried to combine the, uh, lever bell with, um, that, that reach, but not reaching out too far, but cause I have a, I have a pretty light bell, but, uh, but it worked. I kept it in close to me almost like I was rowing, and and it kind of forced my pelvis into that internal rotation, so it worked pretty well. And I, I felt good about just the balance and everything, too, so I think I'm going to use that. Yeah, I mean, that's why I, it's, Chris had sent me a couple to play with while we were in the garage. And uh, that was, you know, I love it. I love those for that reason. But, of course, I, I fire up the Mace people on Instagram. Mm -hmm. It's a Mace. Why are you changing the name? Because like, I don't like calling it a weapon, and I don't use it as one. So we want people to we want people to understand the idea that the leverage is the key, not the fact that you can swat at shit with it. You can do both. So 
Uh, we will, we'll let you go on that note, Coach. Get you back to uh, fixing the house, this damn house. Uh, that's going to be your new uh, show. Um, and, uh, and we'll talk to you next time. All right. Thanks, Ian. I'll talk to you. See you. All right, hey guys, right now at Perform Better, they got free shipping on orders over $49. Obviously, restrictions apply, but check that out. They got some other things on sale as well, so you can double dip. Remember, they can create custom packages that'll help fit your online training. You can send some over to uh, to your clients. You can drop ship, or uh, you can just have them buy it. But you can come up with an equipment package if you call them. They're also kind of a resource for what's going on right now with the shutdowns. And uh, they have stay-at-home training workouts. They have a bunch of workouts. They also have a, a video series they're doing, protecting and saving your fitness business. So check all that out at performbetter.com. All right, now it's time for the Results Fitness University Business of Fitness segment. I am here with Alan Cosgrove. Alan, thanks for coming on. Here we are again. All right. Well, see, one thing is, and people who listen to this segment know that we normally post we record four or five, but we haven't been doing that because of what's going on. And we, I want to kind of keep things as fresh as possible. Things are changing so much. Yeah. So this is the one time we're like, Hey, how you been, buddy? I haven't seen you in a while. I haven't talked to you. Yeah. It is. I mean, it's things are changing on the daily right now. Right. So it's, yes. it's, uh, it's hard to record six in a row right? when the, yes. the game's changing every couple of days. And, and that's, that's kind of the topic that I really wanted to talk about today, because I know, you know, you and Rach have been talking a lot about giving a lot of great advice, whether it's on the perform better video series or on your social media. And one of the things it's reinventing yourself. Like you have to be ready to reinvent yourself. And I, I've been thinking about this a lot and I wanted to talk to you guys, like exactly what do you mean by that? Like, what do you mean? Like, should I be offering different services? Should I be changing my name? Like, what do you guys, what exactly are you talking about by reinventing yourself? So I think if we look, we'll look back over uh, other businesses, right? Um, Southwest Airlines started off as the low cost family traveler. And then they realize that that's not sustainable because the market change and there's only so much traveling that, that people do. And then they repositioned themselves as a low cost business traveler. And they had like early bird check in and, and a free drink or something. And, and they just, it was the low cost airline for business travelers. Netflix started as a, a no late fees DVDs in the mail. And now it's, it's beyond streaming. It's, uh, television and, and film production company. And that's just reinvention happens all the time. And for us in fitness, the, the traditional model was one-on-one -on -one training uh, by packages, by 10 at a time. You had a gym membership that got you access to the gym. And in most gyms, group exercise was free. And that was the original model. Well, now with the growth of boot camps and different types of training, Group exercise and instruction is now a value add and people charge for it. The, the membership where you just pay for access to the gym, that's just one factor. And instead of, and where we, I don't want to say pioneered it, but at Results Fitness, we had a membership model for training where you pay monthly instead of just a 10 pack or something. So reinvention is nothing new, but the fact remains is that sometimes change is forced upon you. And right now, every gym in the in the I think in the world is closed, right? And a lot of gyms are able to still deliver some type of a service, either through uh, some type of. Uh, we were t talking earlier. I like the phrase remote coaching, right? So we're not. I don't want to use the term online because you can deliver it a bunch of ways. You can deliver it through your cell phone. You can deliver it on an app. It, it doesn't have to be, you yeah. know, sitting at a, a desktop or a laptop. But people are doing either live classes or they're recording workouts and people are watching it later or they're delivering the workout uh, via some type of, of an app or software where, where the, the members are getting their custom workout. And I think a lot of that is here to stay. I think we've been able to pivot uh, that the only thing missing, we rented out equipment and we talked about that previously and we rented it out at, at zero charge. 
right? It was what we did to our for our our members, um, as long as they continued to to pay their membership. But our idea then is the only thing that went away was access to the actual facility. Because if you'd been listening to us for a while, I've always talked about positioning yourself, re- repositioning yourself instead of a, being a gym and a trainer who who supervises the sets and reps, as positioning yourself as an expert who designs a program and delivers it to the client. So we're still able to deliver the program. The delivery system has changed. And now it's either through an app. And as we talked about, a lot of people were... Um, scrambling to get on board with with um uh, i know train heroic is, is, is the sponsor of the podcast we're, we're scrambling to get on board with with all these things but a lot of gyms are actually using this as their workout uh records anyway they were yep. starting to use that instead of pen and paper yep. so the fact that it can be delivered through online means that's just like a bonus like yep. the the record keeping and designing the program hey you used to write it down with a on a piece of paper with a pencil, and then maybe you went to typing it, or maybe you went to Excel. Now it's just on a on a screen. So that part is just how we're going to deliver programs. But I no longer have to keep a filing cabinet at the gym with the program printed out. Yeah. Uh, with our, our classes, I mean, it's obviously not as good, right, if I can't coach you in person and correct your form. But it's way better than you, you know, taking a, a fitness magazine workout and just doing something on your own with, with no semblance to it. So when we say reinvention, we're really talking about how will the business look going forward, right? And I think that uh, there's some people right now who are saying gyms will never come back. They'll you'll never reopen. People will love the home workouts so much. I don't think that's true. And I think the people that say that have never belonged to a cool gym because a lot of your members are coming because of the culture and the energy and the camaraderie, you know, right? That, that part's not going to go away. Like they're still going to want that, but I think that the uh, the options of you know perhaps it's an, a value add to your members where hey if you miss the workout it's going to be up in our Facebook group uh, and you can do it yourself later. Um, if you can't make it to the workout, maybe there's a streaming version that we do. Maybe we're offering separate streaming workouts like a like a your own on demand video channel, but it's the the technology's there and it's. So I can remember record, trying to record video and get it into a PowerPoint presentation, and it was so hard yeah. and so time-consuming. And now I've got a, one of my athletes sent me an Instagram message with a video of her doing the exercise. Is this right? <laughs> right? Yeah, it's yeah. so easy now. The technology is there. And we're just uh, – I'm kind of a slow adopter with that stuff, to be honest, like personally. But you can't now. You've got to be an early yeah. adopter. You've got to be moving quickly. You so when, good, when we talk about reinvention, it's really just this idea that you're, you're, when we reopen, you may be restricted to how many people can come in. Your programming may change, so you're not circuiting as much. You're doing more like a, what we call military-style or command-style classes where people just use one piece of equipment. Thing, things are going to be different. Uh, your goal right now, if you're listening to this, is to try to be ahead of it. Right, to try to to lead instead of just responding. Absolutely. And I think there's a lot of opportunity here. And we were talking, I was saying about, I've been doing for three years. I sold the gym three years ago, uh, a little over three years. So before I left that gym, a year before everybody was coming in, was using the app. to. So I got rid of clipboards and they were using the app. And there's also, once I sold the gym, it made it so much easier for them because I still had them come in once a week. I rented from the guy I sold it to. And the other days they were, okay, go join these other gyms or do stuff at home. What do you have? I put their other workouts, their Monday, Friday workouts in the app. And so it was such an easy transition for me once I sold the gym that they were used to the app and that's how we did it. But there was also this idea that, it could be a value add in terms of, okay, you're coming to me Monday, Wednesday, Friday, but I still got the app. So here's what I want you to do uh, from a stretching perspective on Tuesday, yeah. Thursday, Saturday. Here's my golf fitness warm up for Saturday morning. I'm going to put it on the uh, on the app. So when you get to the course, you can have it. Also, I think there's an opportunity to keep this stuff going. And like you said just now, okay, um, if somebody's got an objection to say, Alan, 
you know, I love what you guys are doing, but I've only, you know, I've missed one of the classes a week, the last three weeks. Well, guy, we have it on the app. You could do it at any time. Do you need some equipment? We can hook you up. We can send yeah. some equipment to perform better. And so I think there's a value add, but then there's also, hey, maybe there's a new membership level, $50 a month for uh, only for, for graduates of the program. We don't want new people coming in just on this, or maybe we do, but uh, $50 a month and you have streaming workouts, uh, you know, seven days a week. I don't know, whatever it might be, but to me, that's what I'm thinking of moving forward from this perspective of. I, I, I think you're, you're, you're absolutely right. I used to have clients and I've always said this, that when you join Results Fitness, you don't join a gym, you hire an expert as your your coach and your advisor for all your your fitness and all your goals. And so I've, I've always had clients who, uh, even at different price points, especially with high school kids, they they couldn't afford my fee to train with me four times a week. So they train with me once a week and do the other ones on their own. And I would always te just teach the other exercises. Well, now I've got video. They, they can click the exercise and see how to do it. Every, like, like, how do I do an RFE split squat? What is that? Just click that. There's the video. You're like, oh, I got it. I remember now. Yep. I, and it's so that the, the limitations before, like I used to work in New York as a one-on-one -on -one trainer. And I moved back to Scotland for a while and then I moved out here. And I just had to give up my clients, right? And even then, like I always look back, I could have I could have sold that business. There was a business that I could have sold. I didn't know anything at the time. I just recommended a trainer that they took over. But I know clients who would have, they knew enough about training from working with me so long that they would have happily paid something for me to continue to write their programs. We just didn't have a way to deliver it then. Yeah. Right. And now we do. And I, I think it's there, there's going to be uh, uh, there's there's still going to be people who want to do every workout with a coach in the gym. And there's going to be people that just because of their schedule, they can't make it in your hours. And so I think a a remote uh, streaming classes is going to definitely be something. Um, and it, it may be delivered via Zoom where the coach can actually coach people in real time. Or it may just be recorded like an old school workout DVD where you do the workout on your own later. But you've got a coach or someone demonstrating the exercise so you can see how to do it. There's just – there's everything that's existed before I think will still be there. But there could be – this could be an upgrade for people that, hey, you'll get access to our online classes. If you've got the people in the northeast, the snowbirds who go away – uh, in the winter, well, they used to cancel their membership or freeze. We well, now they're like they still get the workout delivered to them. Yeah, right. They still get access to you, and it's it's just the the, the key phrase I want people to to think of is uh, I I got an email from a mutual friend of ours uh, yesterday, and it was basically saying I just I don't like doing the Zoom workouts or the Facebook Live. What I've been doing is just I send them a workout uh, based on what they've got, and I just send them an email. What do you think? Like, dude, you're you're gonna you're not gonna win, right? The game has yeah. changed, yeah. right? Like, you've got to be able to, in order to continue to charge the prices that you have been, you've got to deliver a value beyond that, right? I one of our coaching members used to do a six week fifteen hundred dollar course, training course, just six days a week for for six weeks, and uh, charge fifteen hundred for that. And uh, your first reaction is, no one will pay fifteen hundred for. A, a six week membership. And his answer was always, what would you have to give before you'd think it was worth it? And I think this is the same as we've, we've got so much technology. Why are you not embracing it when your competition is embracing it? I think it's, I think the, the, how we deliver programs are, we've got one-on-one, -on -one, we've got, uh, I call a small group as everybody's doing the same program. Semi-private is a small group where they've got individualized program. And we've got the large group or boot camp. And I think now we're going to have at home uh, delivered via an app. And we're going to have streaming and we're going to have video. That's seven ways to deliver this product. And I think you're going to, you maybe don't have to do them all, but you're going to have to do multiple, right? The, the, your your uh, model of being a gym that people pay to have access to your equipment is, I think that's dead. You've got to have access to expertise and people are going to consume it how they, they want to consume it. I seen something um, recently, uh, a, a Pixar movie or a Disney movie just went straight to video on demand. It skipped the theaters because theaters are closed. I, I think the future of that will be, people will always love the theater going to the movies 
but there will also be people who will be like, I don't want to go to the movies. I want to yeah. watch it on my couch. And I think the delivery system of this stuff's just going to, it's going to be up to the consumer, right? Absolutely. I think it's going to uh, force people to, uh, you know, gyms and trainers to, uh, to step it up a notch and to uh, deliver a better product, be more professional and to kind of stay ahead of the game. And uh, I think this is teaching us that we can do that. So, uh, Our change got forced oh. upon us. Our, our goal is yes. to try to stay on top of it and, and do it uh, quicker than it getting forced upon us. But what if it goes to now, nah, Anthony, that only eight people can be in the gym ever at one time? Is your income capped at that? Only if you, if that's all you can do. If yeah. you can stream and you can do other things, we we got a we. It, it's exciting times if you if you just pivot your mindset too. Yep, absolutely. Alan, thanks for doing this. And all right, uh, see we'll you next week. Back. Yeah, thank <laughs> you. <laughs> hey, this is Greg Cook. Uh, got some observations about corrective exercise. We've talked about uh, different things you can do to get people ready for corrective exercise and make sure your strategy is in check. But ways to elevate awareness are probably the first order of business. And as I said before, it's not about reading somebody their score sheet. It's about putting them in the same challenging positions and patterns that the test revealed they may have difficulty with. And number one, let them work it out theirself. Don't over instruct something that should be fundamental. We've already brought it up to this conscious attention. Now put them in the obstacle and let them work through it. And a lot of the new corrective exercises we're doing really push us up against that. We're, we're doing a lot of stuff in balance and actually realizing that, you know, even though we must discuss mobility and stability separately, they usually get better together quicker. And what I mean by that is anything that can sort of demand an inch of length and an ounce of strength at a time is probably going to both gain you the attribute, a little bit more freedom, a little bit more control, but at the same time at a challenge level where you still have to be hyper aware of your limits and realize you're still not as good as you think you are, even though you just got one click better than you were. And so it's that, that razor's edge, that sensory rich environment right up at the edge of your ability is where we really polish and sand movement patterns. But I think a lot of people hear stress. Well, where are the bands? Where are the bells? Where are the bags? Sometimes it just squeeze balance. The same way you adjust yourself to balance yourself on a narrow beam is how you organize yourself when you pull a deadlift. And so finding alignment prior to a pull or a press or a push is just like finding alignment walking on a balance beam. And so a lot of times when I find athletes that do have balancing problems, YBT, motor control screen, hurdle step, I don't start talking about glute meat or mobility or anything like that. I just basically take them across the room to a balance beam. And I'm like, we're doing 30 laps right now. You're going to walk down, you're going to back up and I'm just going to smoke them on the balance beam, but I'm not coaching them or yelling at them or anything like that. They're smoking their self because their balance and disorganization reveals their inefficiency. This great athlete with this unbelievable heart and lung engine and these, this great hip drive should not be smoked on a balance beam, which means he's got great power in the slot that he's developed that power. But as soon as he's off balance, most of that power is dampened down just like the governor on a car. Well, what's the very first thing we do with him? Because going in and overcoaching his balance is basically going to create an anxiety situation. He already feels vulnerable and he already feels off balance. That's not a good time to be coaching people. Permission to breathe, permission to breathe. And a good thing is drop your jokes and drop your humor now because laughing and breathing are really similar in that they change the volume of your breath. But getting a little bit more organized on the breath, using some breathing tricks. We've got some new breathing resets we do. Uh, Dr. Wild has a four, seven, eight little breath cleanse that he does. You would be amazed at just how clearing the breath does it. That is not me walking beside you on the balance beam, telling you how to breathe in your diaphragm and not in your chest. And that's with my exact fear when the fitness industry started 
really realizing how poor a breathing population we were, we immediately started overcoaching breathing instead of looking for the reason that breathing was compromised in the first place. Sometimes it's driven by psychosocial problems. Sometimes it's a physiological problem. Sometimes it's a respiratory problem. And, and that's why we've gotten into breathing evaluation, because if we're going to reconnect movement and breath the way it was originally intended to be discussed in the first place, uh, yoga, Tai Chi, Indian clubs, any ancient wise teaching of body movement and exercise never pulled apart the breath and the move. And we overcoach the move and then see really poor breathing and then come back in and try to add all these breathing cues. You should have grown those two things together from the very beginning. You should not be overcoaching either one, the breath and the movement come together. And by having ways to screen and test those things, we become more aware because I was doing the same thing. I was over overvaluing movement and undervaluing that breath, that sequence, and that mind-body connection. Well, now that we've got tests that show where your biggest problem is, I can train your breathing to help you with your movement, or I can basically challenge your movement in a certain way and then allow you to breathe easier. The athlete who's having trouble on the balance beam has simply been already planted a few seeds of, hey, slow down your breathing, but to get the same amount of oxygen, you're going to have to breathe deeper. Drop those shoulders. I, I'm not telling you how fast to go on the balance beam. And if I continuously say two things, slow down and breathe, slow down and breathe, slow down and breathe, they will take ridiculously longer on the balance beam than their athletic pride wants them to, but they won't make a mistake. And that's the self-awareness that we're adjusting because we just gave them a self-awareness thing. But by giving them that breathing command saying, listen, your balance needs to be better and it's not great today. But did you see how much adjustment you made just with your breathing? So bringing a bad attitude to a situation will definitely change that situation. Bringing a bad breath to a good exercise will make that exercise more unnecessary stress instead of more awareness and correction. So when we offer those breathing cues, we don't tell people how to breathe. We've already given them maybe a few little cleansing breaths. We've shown how to breathe a little bit deeper, but basically just to drop tension reinsert those cues when they're moving or under mild stress. And if they can adjust themselves, it will be measurable. How? They won't fall off the balance beam. And if you need to prove that point scientifically, take them back over and do a balance test and it'll probably show you a slight improvement. Well, a couple of responses every day to readjust balance before they start really banging on their body is going to cause them over time to have a better balance adaptation. And that will be measured in strength and power once their posture and their pattern are back in alignment. Athletes with a lot of power and poor balance are basically only going to have that power in a narrow slot. And that's why you're going to see their performance or their durability suffer sometimes because we like to measure power in a clean way. But if they don't have that power 3D and we don't have a test that shows that, then good power test, poor balance pretty much says that. And we've got to hear it. Hey, this is Adam. And this is Tim. Welcome to the Train Hook Data Driven Coaching segment. Yeah. So today, Tim and I are going to talk about uh, remote coaching uh, in general and uh, having pivoting, pivoted to it now, a lot of coaches are doing something new. So we thought we'd talk a bit about uh, some things to be aware of there. Sure. And, you know, you know the first thing I think about, Tim, is um, thinking like a product person. So, Ooh. yeah, I like that. Uh, and that, what that means is like, you know, Train Hook, when we're trying to build something and figure out what to do. Um, we have to consider what people actually want and need. Exactly. You know, and me having been a coach, there's lots of cool stuff I could think of doing and things that yeah. I use it when I coach, but probably like 10 other people want some of those. So it's not worth building for us. For sure. And so, you know, what happens with coaches and this happens to everyone is that we have these things that we value and they become, they become really like, uh, they become these biases and, and blind spots where we like really emphasize the things we like and are good at. And we can kind of forget about the stuff that we don't like so much and aren't so good at. Yeah. And I think, you know, that's a good point. So like to, to that end, Adam, I think when coaches jump into online coaching or remote coaching, they, their mind automatically goes to like programming, right? But we actually don't start there with our, with our online coaches and the folks who are kind of in this transition or pivot mode. We, we want to address who the audience is first, right? And th that, that kind of um, lays the, the groundwork for everything moving forward from programming to goal setting you know, all that type of stuff. So step one for you isn't to worry about the programming. I don't think it's to define specifically who do you want to train? 
what jobs to be done there are to like solve those folks struggle and how am I going to get them to where they want to go or how am I going to help them improve the way they want to. So sure. um, I think that is a blind spot. Like we don't think about that in coaching. We're like, Oh, these are going to be the sets and reps. Um, but especially in the online, the world of online coaching, identifying your audience is, is numero uno. Right. And uh, this is particularly important right now because your audience may have changed. A lot of coaches we've oh. seen, right. They've either got new people in their atmosphere, right? People who yeah. just weren't there before. Um, they have people who, the same people with different needs, right? So yeah. now the gym's closed, they're remote, they've got a different stressor in their life. Maybe their focus and their, you know, their, their headspace is a little different. Exactly. Cool. Exactly. So let's talk a little more about like some specific things you can do, right? That okay. can help remote coaching that you may not think of having to do in person, right? Yeah. And so sure. one of those things is, I think, you know, this idea of leaderboards, right? This daily competition. So especially if you've got a big group of people and they're doing, you know, this at-home training, training that maybe is a little less specific than it was before just because they don't have sure. the stuff to do what they were doing. Like leaderboards can just help keep people feeling like uh, there's a reason to do something. There's a reason to try hard, you know? Yeah, exactly. And, and that's a really good point. And I think keeping people engaged is kind of the underlying message there. And like in Train Heroic, we have this new feature called Coach Home, right? Which gives you real quick insight into what everyone has done, you know, most recently. And it gives you, you know, it gives you the ability to take action, right? We have 21st century messaging built in there too. And you can leverage that to reach out to people, to check on them, to send videos and gifts. Um, and I think that ties right into like that first point. Like how are we going to give people that real feel, that in-facility feel um, when they're not there? Because the medium has changed, right? So I think, you know, you know, daily competitions, keeping them engaged, going all the way to, you know, reaching out daily with, with small messages and videos is a super big help to a lot of coaches when you're not seeing your people in person. Yeah. Like you said, you know, remote coaching can end up, you know, it's kind of just natural. You can end up gravitating towards less interaction, right? Yeah. Aren't yeah. Right in front of you, you kind of throw the programming out there and people do it. And then it's like, well, the next day, you know, you now got to do the next, you know, the next set of programming. Right. Right. Um, but like, I think as a, as a remote coach, you have to go out of your way to make those little engagements happen because yeah. they're, you're not in front of somebody and they're not like, you know, pressured through normal so, social forces to interact with you. you know? Yeah, absolutely. But, but and I'm all about like giving it like that personal touch. So like the one thing, if I had to get super specific here, it'd be like video instruction, right? So like you said, Adam, people are not in front of you. And even if they were in facility, they probably have questions for you. Well, how are you going to clarify and make things super clear? we'll use video, right? We have that in the app. You can use other mediums outside of it, but um, video communication would be, a, you know, a number one kind of trick up your sleeve for a coach is put your face in front of your people and provide as much clarity as you can, right? You don't want them reaching out with a ton of questions. So it's a huge lift for you. Attack it at the forefront and give them the information at the beginning. Sure. And I think, you know, what you're saying, you know, comes down to basically like now is a really good time to not be alone. Oh, yeah. um, and a lot Perfect. of people are physically isolated, physically alone, but you can arrange your training in a way such that people have other people on the journey with them. Right. Yeah. Um, totally. you know, if, if you threw me an at home program to do by myself, I would not do it. I would not do anything. I just wouldn't do it. <laughs> yeah, I, no, I, I feel hate that kind of stuff, honestly, yeah. but people if you want that, you pressure me by putting me on a team with other people who can see whether I'm logging on the leaderboard and you can see what I'm doing and yeah. I, now there's some, some, some real, like, uh, some real forces there making me want to, you know, stick with it. Absolutely. It's time to kick butt. That's going to do it for us today. Go to trainhook.com to start your 14 day free trial. You know, we also have a couple new at home programs in there, so you can get started today real easy. And we have new pricing now, uh, to accommodate coaching businesses of all shapes and sizes. You can start as low as nine ninety nine a month. All right, now it's time for the Body by Boyle online.com. Hit the gym with the strength coach segment. Become an insider to Mike Boyle strength and conditioning with staff meetings, in services, and complete access to the MBSC programs. All right, today I got on Scott Carney, and he is no stranger to the show. I had him on uh, after I read uh, one of my big life-changing books, What Doesn't Kill Us, which was about Wim Hof, but he's an investigative journalist and anthropologist. He's worked in some of the most dangerous and unlikely corners of the world. Besides What Doesn't Kill Us, he wrote The Red Market and another book that I just finished called The Enlightenment Trap. If you are at all interested in, in 
any kind of meditation, yoga, Buddhism. Uh, this is just an amazing story, The Enlightenment Trap, but that's for another time. But uh, his latest book, it's not out, it's out in April. Uh, it's called The Wedge. It's Evolution, Consciousness, Stress, and the Key to Human Resilience. Scott, thanks for coming on. What's up, man? It is so great to be back on your show. All right. Well, you know, I think um, it's so much fun because for me because, like I said, what doesn't kill us changed us, changed me uh, in such a way where um, I started to think about things differently, not just, you know, with, with, you know, taking a cold shower. I take a freezing cold shower every morning and try to do some ice baths here and there. Uh, went to go see Ryan, uh doing some stuff. and But I, I, I've kind of taken it into another, uh, a, a little deeper in my own way. And, and I think the wedge mm-hmm. really uh, is really such a great next step for people that have kind of gotten into a little bit of the, you know, the ice baths and, and whatever in the breathing first for the people that have gotten into that as well. Um, but um, let's, let's get into this, the wedge. What exactly is it? Right. Uh, well, first of all, I want to say, it's an honor to think that I changed someone's life. That's just so cool. Uh, and, and I am so surprised constantly how I get emails from people being like, oh my God, like your book, like changed my routines, changed the way I think about my relationship with the environment. And uh, that's always an honor. And, and that's like what you do as an author. That is like the dream. So uh, I, I mean, thank you for, for digging in and, and getting into this. But to your question, what is the wedge? It's big, man. It is, it is a really big concept. And, uh, and I think I want to actually, instead of describing specifically what this technique is, I want to I wanna talk about the meaning of life for a moment, because I think that's really where we have to start. Mm-hmm. Now, we're on this earth for like 70, 80 years. And in this time, we know inevitably we're going to die. Like that is that is absolutely happening. And if life uh, as we live it, you know, is, is wonderful or not wonderful or whatever, we can be absolutely assured that it ends in a minor key, right? If life were a song, it ends in sort of that sa- those sad notes and it's going to suck, right? <laughs> we can't bullshit this. It's going to be bad. And given this knowledge, given the inevitability of our own demise, the question that I think we all have to ask is, what do we do with the time we have on Earth? And there's a lot of different philosophies out there to to answer this sort of fundamental human question. But what I've come to in the course of my research uh, in this book and doing sort of very extreme things is, is realize that for me, and I think for many people, we are obligated to take risks um, in the face of our own mortality, of the of the absolute inevitability of that. There is no way to avoid this, which means that we should not actively try to preserve every moment in perfect safety. Uh, because if you do that, you're not living your life. You're not actually going out there and doing things uh, and to make yourself better, to to take those risks that, that actually build you as a human. And this sort of fundamental concept, my idea that you have to take risk, you have to do things that expose yourself to potential dangers uh, in, in so that you get rewards for that risk, uh, is actually encoded in our nervous system. Every time you feel uncomfortable, every time you think about, say, jumping in an ice water and you have that sort of clenching feeling in your body before you go in there, it's because your body is telling you that's a risk. You don't want to do that. That could potentially um, put us in danger. Uh, and 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 I want to preserve you from death. But what we've learned by jumping into ice water, by doing things that, that you know, by, by lifting weights, trying to get stronger, is, is that suffering actually does help us become more full people, become stronger people, become better people and more able to adapt to things in the world. And so what I'm doing in this book is trying to understand where our hesitation is before we take risks and then how we can overcome those in a sensible way. Now, of course, I'm not saying you should just go run to your demise. That is not the message of this book. I'm saying is that those instincts that we have to protect ourselves are not always rational. And sometimes they prevent you from having the experiences that make us more full and complete humans. Absolutely. And, you know, you did mention 
the weights. And obviously this is the strength coach podcast. And I think it's analogous to like what you're saying as well is it's kind of looking at like, for example, we wouldn't just use 10 pound weights for the rest of our life. We're going to have to use that stress, that extra stress each Mm -hmm. time to get better. Um, And I think sometimes, you know, in, in the book, you did say like, it's the intersection of three things, the body, our minds and the world outside. And sometimes it's really, I feel like what I got a lot of times is the wedge really has a lot to do, obviously, with our minds, because it's how we yes. control that situation. It's me saying, no, I'm going to pick up a little extra heavy weight today, even though I know it could be dangerous. I mean, not life threatening, mm-hmm. really. Um, but but I, I have to do it in order to get better, I feel like. But sometimes in our brain, right. we don't want to do that. Right. We have this no thing that comes on is that, no, we want to avoid the things that are difficult. We don't, you know, our, our nervous systems are hardwired for the easy life. Like we want everything to just be done for us uh, so that we don't have to like actually work to um, face improvement. So every time you go to the gym, every time you face something that is hard, whatever that might be, whether it's physical or emotional or um, a risk in business, you're taking a risk. You're, you're, you're putting yourself under stress. And the reason you're doing that, uh, you know, at the very big level is because you, you, you realize that there is a reward that comes at the end. You know, the meaning of life is not to work a 40 hour work week, um, fully fund your retirement and die comfortably in your bed. Right. I mean, I guess you can do that, but, but think of how much more you can do when you put yourself under stress and you find new ways to make yourself um, you know, more full, have to have bigger, better experiences. And oftentimes that means facing down dangers, facing down things that could really, really hurt you. And then you have to sort of reason your way through it. Like what's the way to take a risk, but take it as rationally as possible going forward and ignore that thing that's in your body right now saying, no, I don't want to get out of bed and fucking hit the gym. I don't want to go get out of bed and turn that shower to cold. Like what is that thing in our mind that's doing that? And, and when is it right? And when is it just dead wrong? Yeah, and I like the way you say in the book, too, it's a choice to separate that stimulus and response. And Mm -hmm. I guess for me, you know, it's like you had said, the cold shower, ice bath, it's the mental trick we use to suppress the shiver response. So for me, uh, again, it's so it's mental. And so we're if people don't believe you there, we there's research that shows that you you can right. change that physio, physiological response because when you're shivering you're trying to burn some mm-hmm. calories to warm up but if you go in there and relax into a parasympathetic state now other mm-hmm. uh, there's other processes other physiological responses that have to warm you up so right. that that's the way that mental piece of me saying and i i the trick that i use is i say oh my god this is going to feel so amazing. I need this because I worked out totally. last night and this is so refreshing. This is, I'm totally trying to tell myself this is so the, the shower today just happened to be super cold. And I was right. like, this is amazing. And I, and then I do feel so much better. Somebody like, cause I walk outside with no, no, usually no, no jacket on all the time. And people mm. are always like, oh, aren't you cold? And I'm really, I'm, you know, I feel cold, but at, at times, mm-hmm. but I'm not, cold. It doesn't bother me. It could be too, like right. maybe below 20. I start to feel, okay, uh, I can do it for 40 minutes to an hour right now when I'm walking the dog. But th- I, I am mm-hmm. saying to myself, you know, it, that, that this, oh my God, this, this feels great. I, I don't need mm-hmm. this jacket. And, um, right. and like you said too, I, I, I feel like I got something a little bit, I know it sounds silly, but I got, yeah, I, that's right. I got in the cold shower today. What'd you do? <laughs> Right. Totally. And, and, you know, that's really important that you say it doesn't bother me because we all still feel these stimuli outside of our bodies, right? We, we still acknowledge that the environment impacts us, but does it bother you? Are you able to take that stimulus that's coming outside that 20 degree air and say to yourself, actually, this is okay. There is a point where it will be dangerous and it will be bad for you. We all know that, but at 20, you have play here. You have the ability to be like, no, 
this is okay because my body will um, rise to meet this challenge. And, you know, this is the thing that's so interesting about the wedge. We're talking about different frames of reference at various points. At one point, I'm like, this is the thing that you need to take risk to do it, go into business or the motivation to, 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 to you know, uh, suck it up and get out of bed and jump in the cold shower. That's sort of like, like planning. That's like your mind doing it. But also there is this other side that's in your nervous system where your nervous system is making those same um, fearful reactions. It's like your the actual feeling of shivering can be a hard emotional thing to, to get where you're clenching and it just feels bad. Or it can be like what you said. It's like, no, I go in there with this idea, like this is going to be joyous. This is going to be fun. And I'm going to look at the end results. And then your actual experience in the moment is pleasure and not pain. And we have the ability in our mind to make that switch between, as you say, uh, sympathetic or to parasympathetic, where sympathetic is grit and parasympathetic is flow. And we can just literally train ourselves to move between these different states so that our actual experience of the world is different and then our results are also different and we have control over it. So interesting. And would you say also, though, part of the goal is um, not only to create that space, but to create a different response? Because aren't I really creating right. a different response? Yes, exactly. So the, this metaphor of the wedge, you know, this term that I'm using is is the idea we have the stimulus, which is the, the cold weather, for instance, and then we have the response, our shivering, our um, uh, or our clenching up or anything that might go with that stimulus and response. And the wedge is how we're literally you know, forcing space between those two things. So it's not just an immediate reaction where we just let our bodies do their programming. We say, wait a minute. I have a choice here and that my choices um, matter. And, you know, you think about it, like it, 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 it's as simple as if, let's say you were gonna sneeze and you felt that sneeze coming on and you know, it's a, this tickling feeling in your nose, This maybe it's sort of painful, like how do you describe that? But you know that those sensations exist. And then you can tell yourself, I am going to try to resist this. And most of us can at least delay that experience from happening. Um, you can even shut off your sneeze uh, entirely. And it's because we're focusing on the, that, on, on those sensations. And by doing that, we create space between whatever is stimulating the, the sneeze and the actual sneeze, which is your response. And uh, although training you, yourself not to sneeze is probably not all that useful, take that concept and apply that to anything in the world. And then you'll understand where the wedge is. Yeah. And I, I do, we're going to get to them, but I want people to understand that, you know, Scott jumped in a bunch of different realms to kind of help you uh, like start to be able to figure out other ways that you can insert wedges. Scott, how is this? I kind of thought of neuro-linguistic programming and Tony Robbins of like interrupting a pattern. Is sure. there something, is it kind of like that? Totally. Uh, and I, I think that it's really important for me to, to, to preface is that I did not invent this. And Tony Robbins did not invent that. And yeah. Wim Hof did not invent cold water or breathing <laughs> protocols. These fundamental um, uh, things go back at least to the origins of yoga and probably way before that, too, because we've always had this very similar biology. We've always been in command of it. And as long as we've had the ability to reason about our reactions and our stimulus, we've been doing things uh, that are uh, interventions that 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 stop sort of passive cycles of of stimulus and response reaction, you know, uh, stimulus and reaction. And in, in fact, the very at the very heart of this, it's about human consciousness, right? Like, why do we have this ability to make choices about our biology? Why can you choose to take a breath now and then hold your breath for a minute? Like, why did we even get that as animals, as an ability? And uh, and and so the wedge is a natural thing that evolved, not just in us, but probably in any other um, higher mammal uh, and possibly other creatures, too, that have the ability to make decisions about their environment. And when and here's the interesting thing. When you make decisions about your environment, you make decisions about your underlying biology as well. So true. So interesting. Um, another kind of weird connection I made believe it or not, was Viktor Frankl in Man's Search for Meaning, who wrote Man's Search for Meaning, and, and really about, you know, his, his 
uh, psychiatry uh, theories were about, you know, finding meaning and purpose in life. It's the key to personal happiness and well-being. And when he was in Auschwitz, his his thoughts, like he he kept saying, like, no, you know, you you are in control of your thoughts. And to me, it's mm-hmm. it's very similar to this, that, OK, when you get in the ice when you get in that really high heat and you get that claustrophobia that you're controlling, right. you know, I'm OK, that that is right. changing your biology. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, you think about any sort of um, neuroscientist that's out there, what, what they're talking about is is, you know, how you they're looking at how. Um, maps of neurons going from your peripheral nervous system for your fingertips all the way into the center of your brain, how those all wire. Well, thoughts must change your biology at some point. We know that you you think something and you must be creating neural patterns that are different. That is absolutely every thought changes something about your physiology uh, and certain other types of thoughts can change more of your, your biology. And I think that the, that, Absolutely, what you're saying is that you're in control of your thoughts, but to some degree, you're also in control of your body, especially when you realize that you can control your body by controlling your sensations in an environment, um, because that's really the the critical link between a pure thought, um, you know, thinking about um, you know what it's like to be on your podcast. That's a that's a sort of esoteric thought, but then there's this other thought: is like, am I feeling a, a pit of anxiety for talking to the great Anthony Renna right now, <laughs> right? And that's and and there's this there's this clenching uh, in, in the stomach to some degree, and and that's a sensation. Uh, that's the sensation of anxiety. And then if I realize that that I have some control over that sensation, I can literally relax that stomach, and that actually relieves anxiety. It's it's truly fascinating to, to sort of follow the links between thought and then sensation, and then realize there's a choice in that sensation. Yeah, and and if if, you, if the strength coaches and trainers didn't catch the connection here. Um, I think one more example is, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of our athletes or they're afraid of certain things of doing certain things, not only in gym, but like a game is coming up. And I, I heard this great thing from Michael Hyatt when about public speaking, which, you know, it doesn't have to always be life threatening. Although they say like public speaking is one of the most, uh, uh, most feared, uh, activities that we can do, um, is, he, he changed it around. He said, okay, when he was sweating and nervous, he said, he just, in his brain, he said, this is my my body's way of preparing for high performance. And, you know, we've heard so many of the greats, mm-hmm. like Wayne Gretzky and so many great Michael Jordan, right. they would throw up before games. I mean, even then they were so, so understanding that and understanding that this is what your body's going to go through. It's preparing you for this high performance. To me, this is where right. all of this stuff connects to the sports world. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, we, we feel anxiety and, uh, and evolution put anxiety there for a reason, right? I mean, it, we all evolve from some sort of common root and that anxiety is actually beneficial. And as you point out, you know, Michael Jordan vomiting before his, um, his big game is his body getting ready. It's, it's, it's probably a surge of adrenaline. And then uh, you know, maybe it pushes him over a certain limit, but he comes back and then, you know, he's freaking Michael Jordan. He owns that court. Uh, uh, and, and, and all of these sensations are actually important. You're not always fighting things that even seem negative. Uh, you're, you're sometimes using those things that seem negative to your advantage. Very cool. Well, let's, let's kind of segue this into start some of the different chapters. And one of them that was pretty cool is the one on fear and your trip to the Huberman lab. Uh, talk sure. to us about this trip. Okay. So here was the question that I had going into this. You know, I, I've, I've, studied with the Wim Hof method for years. I've climbed up Mount Kilimanjaro in a bathing suit and it's negative 30 degrees outside. And I'm wondering, well, what is that connection between the body and mind? And, and more importantly, what other things can I do to train myself other than just cold exposure and heavy breathing and, you know, those, those methods. And I wanted to find something that is visceral, that we all can identify with an emotion, uh, that, then maybe we can train 
And so I searched her all around the world and I looked for neuroscientists who I admired and thought had, were really on the cutting edge. And I came by Andrew Huberman, who is a Stanford neuroscientist. You may have seen his like Instagram feed. It's full of like amazing um, neuroscience tidbits on how to become a better, higher performer. But he's a just super smart guy. Um, and also like MMA fighters, like covered in tattoos. And he like spends his time um, swimming with great white sharks. He's like, the 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 most macho neuroscientist at the neuroscientist <laughs> uh, convention, uh, and what his research is on is uh, is how humans experience fear, and what those what the neural wirings are that do that, and then also how you can intervene in fear to change the way you react um, to things in in the outside world, and the the. Uh, uh, oh man, uh, to, to go through the whole chapter is going to be would be a little hard. But essentially, he goes and dives with great white sharks, videotapes, uh, not videotapes. I guess we're using like 3D virtual reality um, camera collects uh, footage of his shark dives, brings that footage back to his laboratory, and then puts people with panic disorders in that virtual reality simulation to watch. How that how these people who are wired to be scared of sharks um, physiologically respond to fear. So he measures like their blood pressure, their eye movements, uh, and uh, other autonomic, which means automatic, the things your body just does naturally in reaction to a threat. Um, he he exposes them to this threat and then watches how they react, and then this information is used to create um, treatment protocols for people uh, to help them, you know, deal with any sort of fear, not just you know the fear of sharks. Yeah, and what I what I really kind of was so interested in this one was, you know, <laughs> did it always have to be life threatening? And then you were talking about some movie pre previews that you probably couldn't get through, so it doesn't always <laughs> have to be this complete life threatening, mm -hmm. like, oh my God, I'm in the water. Cause he was using virtual reality for this basically. Right. Um, and right. to create those responses and to help you is that that's the cognitive behavioral therapy for the most part, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. so. so what he's, what he notes about fear, which is so interesting is that fear is really about your relationship with time. So you're, 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 you, you know, and there's a threat coming and you see the threat. And when the threat is coming, your mind, uh, when it's a uh, scared identifies what that threat can do from you and predicts what the future might be. And that's good, right? That's good to know what a threat might do to you. But people who are overset, over fearful, right? People who are, have fear disorders get so stuck in that moment of being rendered apart by that shark that they freeze and cannot take action, um, uh, to alleviate that, um, that, that sensation. And then, you know, they get eaten by the shark because they're paralyzed. And that is really fascinating to see how time becomes not only in your cognition, but actually is wired into your nervous system. Um, that fear becomes sort of this automatic thing. Like, you're you're not necessarily in control of how your body decides um, to get fixated on that moment. And so his research and his experience and his various types of training are are trying to insert wedges into um, that that sort of automatic response so that you can um, you know get out of that cycle. Now, for me personally, when I go into his lab and I sit with his virtual sharks, um, I have to say, uh, I'm underwhelmed by them because, yeah. you know, and I, I was, I was really excited because, you know, I, I wanted to feel fear. I wanted him to trigger something in me that was like terrifying so that, that I could feel that sensation of terror and then do something about it, try to control it. But you need a stimulus that's strong enough to do that. And for me, Someone who, you know, I, I, I've been a reporter for 15 years now. I've worked in war zones. I've, you know, had people hold me up with AK-47s. I take risks fairly frequently. Um, a, a, a movie of a shark is just not going to do it for me. So my experience leaving Huberman's lab was, wow, you have such amazing research. This really uh, ludicates how I can um, potentially find interventions, but man, you need a better stimulus. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, and, that, and that led me um, after hanging out with Huberman for a bit to try to look for other things that where I am programmed 
to um, have a fear response where uh, my own experience of, of, of an exercise is like, oh, this is actually scary so that I can evoke those sensations and evoke those emotions in myself to actually train something interesting. Can and it kind of made me think of this, too, is um, I kind of have done, I don't know if you can call it the reverse wedge. My wife loves haunted houses. And mm -hmm. so in the beginning, I kind of was like, I got the, I got a lot, I had a lot of fun with her, like her reactions to them, but I wasn't mm -hmm. always so scared, but then I really tried to change it and I tried to be scared. So I feel like nice. that's like the opposite wedge. Cause I was, I wanted to experience that. I wanted to have fun. I knew in the back of my mind, kind of like you knew with the sharks, but at the same time, I kind of reversed right. it and I wanted it to be there. Sure. Well, that's not the reverse wedge. That is also the wedge. You're just trying to change what the output is for yourself. Okay. You know, your your stimulus and response, like the stimulus was a, a guy jumping out in a ghost outfit, and your response was meh, right? What yeah. you're trying to do is say, actually, no, I'm still trying to insert myself between that stimulus response. And I'm trying to say, no, that's a real ghost. And it's gonna rip my face off. And that's how you um you got yourself into that fear state. That's the interesting thing about the wedge. There's no one way that it works. Mm -hmm. Everything is subjective and you're playing with um, the stimulus, you're playing with your, that moment of choice and you're, you're playing with the response and you feel, and, and you can actually change any of those things um, with a little bit of work and a little bit of um, uh, a mental trick. Absolutely. Well, Triggery. let's Not go triggery. into uh, the next part is the flow. And, and for first, just right. let me preface it with the, this is, uh, some kettlebell tossing and it's, it's not just so everybody knows it's, it's not for exercise. Um, Scott's the first one to say that. And, um, and it's not something that he's recommending people do, you know, in their gyms right now, because obviously there's liability issues, et cetera. Right. But it's a really in, like, to me, an incredible way to kind of, and an easy way to get into this idea about flow. Let's talk about uh, your your time with uh, uh, with the kettlebells. Hey, so when I was leaving um, uh, the Huberman Lab, I actually got a phone call, sorry, a text message from a friend of mine in the Bay Area who was like, "Scott, you got to meet this dude, Michael Castro Giovanni. He will put you in an instant instantaneous flow state by making you throw kettlebells." And like, I hear this, and I'm like whatever, you know, because one, I have never been a big kettlebell fan. It's just not been, uh, a, a exercise that I cared about. Um, and, uh, but I, I, I felt like, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll give it a, I'll check it out. And so what he does is I meet him in San Francisco and we're on this you know, top of like a little, um, uh, hill in a, in a, in a, in a park in San Francisco. And he stands opposite me and, you know, with, I think nothing, too heavy. I think it was like either a 25 or a 35 pound um, kettlebell. And, and he's literally going to throw it at me, right? He's literally going to throw this, this, this 25, 35 pound weight at me. And I'm supposed to catch it and use the swing, use its own momentum and return it to him. And I actually feel pretty terrified by this. One, I've never met Michael Castro Giovanni before. Two, um, when two men face off against each other, holding lumps of iron in their hand, <laughs> usually that's an adversarial situation, right? And yeah. Castro Giovanni is way bigger than me. He's like a gorilla of a human. And, uh, and so there's this, this innate sense of danger, uh, that, that comes with any exercise like this. And, and we throw it, you know, you do this thing. There's a whole ritual for how you want to throw it. Um, and you know, you 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 you're locking eyes with each other, uh, and then you 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 swing it up uh, once. You swing it up twice, and on the second one, you 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 shift your gaze from each other's eyes to the kettlebell. And on the third throw, it flies through the air, and you're supposed to catch it, let it go between your legs, and throw it backwards. And I was legitimately scared at this point because I didn't want to hurt myself and I didn't want to hurt him with this sort of new move. But what was so fascinating is that because it's a fairly, that the movements are fairly easy uh, and we're both focused and there are, are actual stakes, there's the actual danger of getting hurt. We both get intensely focused on this bell and 
in a, in a minute or two, it's like we're dancing. It's like we're just throwing this back and forth and we're freestyling with this kettlebell. And, it, and it, I move from terror to fun to, to a, a, literally a flow state, which means that, that both he, his actions and my actions were automatic. We weren't paying attention to what the other person was doing, but we were throwing this bell. And it was, um, it's a blast. It's one of my favorite practices that has come out of this book. And, you know, you said that it wasn't a workout. It actually, it is. Your heart rate gets up, you know, you're, 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 over the course of 30 minutes, you might throw, you know, five, six, seven tons of iron back and forth. Um, it's it's a pretty amazing exercise, but you're not doing it for the exercise. You're doing it for that connection you feel with somebody else and and literally the movement of the bell. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. That that is what I meant. I because uh, I've heard you say that. So um I didn't mean you weren't gonna get anything out of it physically. I just it was the the idea, the purpose was uh, but Right. Here's the thing, um, you know, I think this can resonate with a lot of people, too, in terms of like, you know, you you are, you know, you have experience with meditation and and the breathing. And for somebody who doesn't have that or doesn't want doesn't really that doesn't resonate with them. This might be something right. that can get you into that meditative state, that flow state that uh, can totally. be important, especially in these days with just the distractions that we're having. Um, mm -hmm. But um, but I want to ask you. Yeah. You know, it said in the book, the the flip from fear over to competence is the moment yes. when the wedge starts to pay off. But let me ask you, when the fear turns into to like this fun, because you obviously you're, you're like you're loving this. Does that change mm -hmm. the whole process? I mean, if I'm not afraid, will it be the same? Because you're really not super afraid anymore. You're competent now. Yeah, well, I'm a, but I'm also aware of the risk. Right. You know, at no point in this in, in the kettlebell throwing is the risk of hitting your foot or hitting someone else and breaking something not present. And I think the reason why kettlebell like this kettlebell throwing is so interesting is this question of risk that I started out at the top of this show is that that risk will always be there. Yeah. And, and if you guys are not focused on the reality of that risk, you're going to mess up. You're going to drop the bell. You're going to fall out of flow. Luckily. I've never hit my foot. You know, I have fallen out of flow before, but I've never um, actually hurt myself. So the danger is there and it's present and you have to be aware of it and you have to realize those stakes are there. And it's because of those stakes um, that we both get into that 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 mutual cooperation and you could actually get to that dance. In fact, if you were just totally blasé about it, um, you're going to hurt someone. You're going to hurt yourself or you're going to hurt the other mm -hmm. person. Uh, and, and in a way, this is what I love so much about the kettlebell thing. Um, for me, I've never really liked the gym. Jim has never really spoken to me because I feel like there's this innate competition um, in the gym. You know, I lift bigger weights. You lift bigger weights. Well, I work out harder. You work out harder. Mm -hmm. and, and that does not appeal to me as a person. But what's amazing about this kettlebell throwing is that if you guys are not in cooperation, you fail. You both fail. It's all about being connected to another person and that you both get the workout. Um, you both are in this experience together. And how often do guys get to do that? You know, like as as two dudes, like, you know, it's you, there's usually this sense of one person being um, the either the mentor or the better person or whatever. But if you're not absolute equals with throwing kettlebells, you've both lost. And I love that. Yeah, I think there could be some really uh, great benefits from like from a team perspective and some bonding perspective mm -hmm. there and, and you know. Uh, throwing some kettlebells with you with some of your teammates to kind of be able, like like you said, with that trust that trust factor and that connection factor, it's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. um, and also with with you know honestly couples, it's really fascinating to see like a girlfriend and a boyfriend or a husband and wife throw kettlebells because, um, and, and this is Michael Castro Giovanni, the guy who invented this whole thing. Um, what's so fascinating is is there's this communication and trust that you have to build by throwing a bell where you see that some people's entire relationship play out in literally how they swing a bell. And like anyone can see it from outside. You can just watch it. And the, the beauty of the kettlebells is that you get into a trust mode without using words, which can be so hard in sort of a sticky relationship. Uh, and it can be really, really beneficial um, between two people to sort of get to that, that place. So there's like, th this practice has really just many, many potential uses, uh, which is why I love it so much. So you've done it with Laura is your wife's name, right? Yes. Yeah. You've mm -hmm. done it with her. Yeah. We, 
We, yeah, we do it. Um, you know, we do it probably once a month. We'll, we'll throw bells back and forth and, you know, we'll use a lighter bell and, uh, and it's great. You know, it's, it's, it's fun and it's, uh, and it's a way, it's a different way to connect with somebody yeah. that's, that's nonverbal. Who, by the way, uh, for my money, Laura is the hero of this book. So, uh, man, she's a trooper, <laughs> she boy. Totally is. <laughs> uh, so, she totally um, is. <laughs> Scott, let's go into uh, um, the prep, and we we have talked in the past about some of the, um, you know, with with uh, what what doesn't kill us, uh, some of the Wim Hof breathing, and it's a big thing in this industry right now. And you went to go visit Brian McKenzie from uh who who is you know known by a lot of people in our uh in our world yeah. and i actually had his partner at uh, power speed endurance uh i'm forgetting his name right now wow because it was right after i read your book i investigated brian and then his company and then had we had a Great. whole podcast on breathing but let's talk about your your um your foray into breathing so uh, I'd been studying the Wim Hof method for a very long time, uh, and and in what doesn't kill us, uh, uh, I interviewed Brian, and and here's what happens with Wim Hof breathing. I sh I think I need to describe that is sure. you breathe really heavily and fast for a long period of time like this. <gasps> And then after 30 or 40 breaths, you exhale and you hold it. And then you for, learn that you can hold your breath for a really long period of time. Uh, and then another thing you can do with the Wim Hof method is you do that same breathing, hold your breath and immediately do push-ups. Uh, and you'll find that you can do usually more push-ups than you can normally do breathing normally while holding your breath uh, right after doing this breathing method. And this is sort of this, this anaerobic boost that that comes with the Wim Hof method. And when I was met, when I met Brian McKenzie initially, and this is back in what doesn't kill us, he was like, that effect is fascinating. And he was developing breathing protocols where he, he would do this heavy, rapid breathing uh, and, and then mix it with high intensity uh, training. And the theory was at the time that this would give people huge boosts in competitions. Uh, and and where I left it at what doesn't kill us is, wow, isn't this fascinating? We're going to see huge athletic boosts from athletes. Fast forward three years, and I, I'm, I'm meeting him again for the wedge. And he's like, yeah, Scott, that didn't pan out. <laughs> he's <laughs> like, uh, we we fucked up. You know, we're experimenting. We're going out. We're we're doing. You know, we're doing an honest investigation and in, and in, in, uh, into this breathing protocols. But he wasn't seeing the transition into um, athletic performance that he wanted to see in in all the people he trained. And and here's what was actually going on: when you breathe really fast, you're 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 inhaling oxygen and you're exhaling CO2. Uh, and that's the most important thing. When you exhale the CO2, uh, your that is the signal that your body has for for when you need to breathe again, when you're at exhaustion. You don't actually detect oxygen, which is your fuel. You detect the waste product of respiration, which is CO2. So if you blow off all your CO2, you actually develop um, in that moment more athletic reserves because your body just doesn't know that it's exhausted yet. Um, that's essentially what happens with this. And so what Brian was training people is to not know what their exhaustion points were um, during the sprints, which gave them a little boost, but it didn't give them consistent returns over time. So what he's done is um, borrowed the Buteco method, uh, which is a, uh, it, it reverses the entire idea of the Wim Hof training. And instead of rapidly blowing off oxygen, he wants to train you over the course of many, many months to have a very high tolerance for carbon dioxide in your system. So he wants you to use restricted breathing during your high intensity trainings. So you're breathing through your nose or through one of those uh, you know, breath restriction masks so that you're getting less oxygen and more importantly, you're able to blow off less CO2. Now, if you train this way over time, what happens is that when you, are in competition and you're breathing normally, you're you've 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 blown off the roof and, and, and you you've you've made it so oh, sorry no, how does he describe it? He says you've raised the floor of where you are. You've raised your your baseline um, endurance, and then 
uh, if you then breathe rapidly in those uh, events in, in like at your competition day, so you, you, you built up CO2 tolerance and now you hyperventilate right before the race, you're going to freaking fly. Right before the race, like right, literally 10 minutes before and during. Or... Oh, and, and during, during. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. I mean, breathe, breathe rapidly because that, that, Oxygen is like sort of the gas pedal for your uh, for re for uh, metabolism, right? You know, the, the oxygen comes in, it bonds with various stuff, it gets to, it, it it provides energy. So you want as much oxygen as you can. And think about it: when you're running and you're getting close to exhausted, what happens to your respiration? It it goes up, right? That's because your body is like, I need more oxygen. So what if you just started breathing heavy earlier? you would have more oxygen and you would get to that exhaustion point later. That's what we see with the Wim Hof method. Um, but what, and so in performance events, breathing really rapidly, very early, much earlier than your exhaustion point um, gives you a performance boost. What Mackenzie wanted was a, a performance boost in all things. And that's why he needed to do the CO2 training. So he wanted you to have that performance boost, boost while you're breathing um, normally. And then you add the, the Wim Hof breathing on top of that and you're doing amazing. Yeah. So, okay. So it wasn't working, but it did seem to work for you because you tested really well and you were only doing Wim Hof breathing, right? True. Yeah. And, and here's the thing though. I was, so when I did that, uh, that hike up Mount Kilimanjaro in my, in my underwear, basically, I was doing the Wim Hof breathing the entire time. <laughs> You know, I never stopped doing that Wim Hof breathing. Um, and so this is why I saw those those um, those huge athletic boosts in in the in the training, um, you know, because I, I got studied at a lab and all that stuff. And there were definitely boosts. But I was also doing the breathing in the moments. Right. So so um, so it, it, the method absolutely provides um, athletic um, uh, uh, improvements, but it's. It, which athletic improvements do you want to do? I was basically sprinting the whole way up the mountain and I, and my breath was allowing me to do it. What with Mackenzie's training, I would also, um, have, uh, um, you know, sort of elevated my, my CO2 baseline overall, um, which would have, and I, I think if I had done his training, this oxygen restricted training and done the Wim Hof stuff, uh, I probably would have done even better on Kilimanjaro. Okay. Yeah. So basically, yeah. So you were doing what he recommended. You were already doing that up Kilimanjaro, that, that heavy breathing. Right. Right. Uh, and, and if you treat it like game day, that heavy breathing is super important, but if you want to train your overall physiology, uh, and this is what I was saying, raise the, the raise the floor yeah. or, or blow off the roof. Right. So, so if you're in a building and your athletic performance is the building, Wim Hof method blows off the roof. So you can just sort of like fly out of that. But the oxygen restriction raises the floor of that building that you're in. So you don't have to jump as high. Absolutely. And another good book that led me to, um, uh, after what doesn't kill us and power speed endurance was the oxygen advantage, which is like talking about breathe a lot about breathing through the nose. Right. I'd totally. And, uh, and I would say definitely read the oxygen advantage as well. If you get, if you, um, get a shot, cause the, that's called, that's the Buteco method. It's great. And it's, it's all about oxygen restriction. Um, and you know, at the end of the day, these are both just tools, right? These are just tools that we have to change the way our metabolism works. And the more tools you have, um, the more tools you can deploy, um, you know, as suits your own personal needs. Sure. And I, I, like the way I look at it too, partially is if we're going to look at, if you're going to like, it's not really a shortcut. But it's about as much of a shortcut as you can get. It's going to accelerate some of these, some of your training if you do some of these things. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, you should you should be trying all sorts of different things in your training because everyone's experience is different. Right. You know, I am sure that there are people for which the Buteco method is horrendous uh, and and cold baths don't do anything for them. Uh, and these people just need to find um, the different things that's that 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 provide the right type of stress to them that they can improve in. I think it's very important to always realize that no one has the solution um, to an individual's problems, that you, it's all about experimenting and finding out what works for you personally. Sure. And we've, we saw plenty of that with your better half. Let's talk about your trip to Latvia. Totally. Um, 
isn't this fun that we just get to sort of like bump around into like these yeah. totally wildly different environments? <laughs> um, cool. So, so like, you know, here I am, I'm, I'm looking for more things that are, that trigger a visceral response in me. Like I want novel environments and I'm, and, and, and the book, the wedge is really my journey trying to find, you know, 10 or 15 different things that, um, that can trigger, um, unusual stuff in me. And, uh, and I wanted to look, you know, I'd already done cold. I'm already like a ice bath warrior. I can take a cold shower like the best of them. And uh, I wanted to look at the converse of that. What is heat like? What is intensive heat? And I and and what are the traditions around the world, the indigenous traditions around the world that use um, intense heat? And obviously in the United States, we have the sweat lodges, uh, all the, the Lakota sweat lodge called the Anipi is an obvious one. Um, but every circumpolar, um, uh, Native American, uh, sorry, uh, indigenous group has some version of the sweat lodge. And I just so happened to get invited to give a talk about um, my various adventures to a group of, uh, of biohackers in Latvia. And they offered to take me to what uh, they call the Pirts, which is their own indigenous traditional um, sauna experience. And so my wife and I show up at this after doing all the, you know, the biohacking stuff, um, we show up at this beautiful sauna in the middle of the Latvian wilderness uh, and uh, and we get dropped off and we meet two um, what they call Pirtsniks, which are shamans uh, of, the, of the sort of the indigenous traditions there. I mean, Latvia is pretty cool because you have like these like almost druidic populations um, that are still there. And if you ask a typical Latvian what their religion is, they will come back and say that they are pagan, which is fascinating. Um, and uh, and what the what what their tradition is, is um, they first sit you down and they give you like food made out of the local environment. So think of like, like bread with like pine needles in it and honey harvested from um, like a local hive and tea brewed out of like birch. And, and like these sort of like very familiar things that are also you're having in this like edible context. And then, you know, after having a little, a little ceremony with them, we go into the sauna. This is my wife and I. We strip off, we strip down naked, and we lie in the sauna, which is pushing 180, um, you know, possibly into the into the 200 degree range. Uh, and then they start rubbing us with the things we just ate. Right. So instead of like the pine needles in the bread, now they're hitting us with pine needles and they're rubbing honey on us and they're and 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 they're and we're experiencing that um, that stimulus from from the, the object in a different context. It's like literally hitting you. And what happens is as this heat rises, we're not noticing the chamber get hotter and hotter and hotter. Um, what we're what I'm noticing is that right now, instead of 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 um, getting hit with pine pine needles, I'm tasting the pine needles. I, I'm I'm hearing the 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 uh, smell of pine. It's it's it induced what they call synesthesia in uh, in neuroscience, where the senses actually get confused. And in that confusion, I'm not realizing that we're staying in the sauna. And I and and every time I get to that point where I start to feel claustrophobic, they drop a new sensation on me. Uh, and we end up staying in the sauna for five hours. It's crazy. Which is crazy. Because the five hours is a very long time at 180 degrees. I don't know if, you, if you've ever done that. But it's like, you know, you can bake a fucking muffin in that time <laughs> at that temperature. <laughs> yeah. And so what? What was, what was, like, what did you get, like, when you felt like, what was the wedge that you really felt? Uh, was, yeah. you know, what, what was the wedge there that you felt like was changing or that you had to, to, you know, use your the right. mindset to get through it? Well, so there were so many different wedges, you know, and here's the thing is that as we go further in the book, um, there, there's, 
it's not just one wedge at a time. There's multiple things that are in play at that any given moment. And the fascinating thing about having a shaman with you take you through that is they are trying to sense what you are feeling, to know that as you, and I call the chapter red line, um, as we, you get to that point where you are claustrophobic and you just need to get the fuck out of that sauna, they want to dial you back just below that point so that you can stay there for longer. You can actually control yourself uh, and your autonomic response. So for me, when I'm sitting on that bench, I am thinking, I let this heat go through me. I can do this. I, I, can, I, can, I can stay parasympathetic in this environment that wants to throw me into like adrenaline running out of the room. And I'm trying to control that. Meanwhile, the, the shaman is is who's standing, I'm lying down, they're wearing um, a hat that, that is a funny looking hat that actually protects them from the, the intense heat to some degree. Uh, and they're putting their hand on me. And when they do that, if I feel hot to them, they know that I am hotter than their body temperature, right? And so now they know what I'm feeling to some degree. And, and they know that if I'm getting too hot and they know how they're feeling in the heat, which is like a little off or a little not off, then they know that at that moment, they can pick up a branch of water and, uh, a, a, and a, a branch of water, what I mean is like a, a, like a leaves, on, like a, a, tree, a tree branch with leaves on it. They dump it in cold water and they sprinkle that above you. So that right at that point where I feel like I'm going to panic, um, this like pseudo rain falls on me and I feel, oh, I can do this. I can do this a little bit longer. Uh, and, uh, and so they're practicing the wedge and I'm practicing the wedge at the same time. So cool. And how is, tell everybody, what was your wife's kind of thoughts about this process? Because again, you, you have, I don't want to say a more advanced uh, mindset when it comes to this stuff, but you've had, you've experienced a lot of this, you know, and mm -hmm. you've been through these different things and had these, you know, these techniques to get through it. What was, what were her thoughts? Yeah. She loved it. Uh, I mean, she found this uh, and like, you know, it's stressful, right? Because you're under this heat and it's very difficult. But at the same time, you also feel so um, relaxed when you're out of it. And, and like your anxiety melts away uh, after this. And, you know, one of the first things we did when we got back home was we bought a sauna so that we can have a sauna um, that we can just go um, um, uh, do all the time. And we, we actually do sauna probably four or five times a week um, together. And, um, you know, my wife is an absolute trooper in all of this. As you said, she really is the star of the book because she comes at it, you know, obviously she trusts me, but she's also not an idiot, right? <laughs> she, she's like, Scott, you're, you're pushing me too far or whatever. Yeah. And she's a, this wonderful rudder to have, to know that where I am and, and somebody else is different. And it's been really wonderful to experience this with her because, you know, everyone's experience in these stimulus is different. And and at the end of the day, I'll never say that my experience was the only one that mattered because hers is also really, really relevant. Uh, and 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 sometimes just very, um, you know, we just have different reactions in different environments. And it's really useful to see that, um, even though we're using the same skills because we're in there and we're trying, we both have the same goal as we're going to stay in this sauna as long as possible, right? Yeah. And, and, and she has different emotional backgrounds and different stresses that she's had. So her actual wedges, the actual sensations that she focuses on to get herself through is going to be different than mine. And that's yeah. fascinating. Yeah. And I think, you know, just to segue this before we do some final thoughts into, for me, there's been a lot of this idea of adaptation, just to kind of bring it back to the strength conditioning world is, you know, what sure. are we doing in the gym? We're adapting, right? And we're adapting to the weights that we lift, to the, the, to the, the bikes that we right. ride, to everything. And so right. to me, that was the same thing about the cold. And I'm, I'm learning, my body's learning to adapt to different environments. And then I started to do some sauna too, like really watching um, that you were doing it as well. But, but Laird Hamilton and the XBT folks were, you know, they're even mm -hmm. going as far as uh, I think he's, he's doing like some, some airdyne bike sprints in the sauna um, right, and they, right, so right, right. what are your thoughts on kind of that piece of it? Have you talked to them or done anything with them since the last time, since what doesn't kill us? Yeah, I haven't um, hung out with them 
uh, sense what doesn't kill us very much. I think I actually did hang out um, with Gabby once uh, over XPT, but there's a huge XPT community here in Denver and um, Eric Hinman and Amy uh, Morrison are two you know, big XPTers. And, and we, I have done the air bike in the sauna before and it pumps up your heart so fast and it's great. Um, I think that there, you know, all the, the wonderful thing about being alive right now is that there are so many people pushing themselves in so many different ways. Uh, and you can find the entry point that you, works best for you. And, and, and you're going to, you know, this is like, you know, no one invented breathing, no one invented ice baths, no one invented heat. Yeah. Um, but, but you find which one um, is, is good. And I think that that high intensity work in a sauna um, I think it can be potentially dangerous. I think you can can sure. risk overheating because what you're doing is you're getting external heat and you're getting internal heat at the same time. So you need to be careful. And I wouldn't just make that your first experience. Yeah. But it's also not that dangerous. Like you can figure it out. You can be rational because you're gonna once you start sensing claustrophobia and 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 the 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 normal sensations that go with overheating, get the fuck out yeah. and have that ice bath nearby. Like don't be you know be prepared. Um, for uh, for whatever happens, and 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 I think you can get a lot out of it. Personally, I don't do as much of um, you know the, the air bike in the sauna. I've done that maybe two or three times. Um, I really like hot yoga, which is you know that 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 whole phenomenon that's out here where you work out really hard in a hundred and five degree room. I think that's really cool, uh, and and you know you can play with it the level that you are comfortable with. Yeah, and I heard Laird talking about. Look, one of the problems you do have as an athlete is overheating. And so what we're trying to do is adapt to mm -hmm. like kind of similar to what, what Mackenzie was talking about with the breathing was trying to change that CO2 tolerance to right. be able to adapt in competition. It's similar to what Laird, again, these are things that, you know, you're not going to do in the average gym, but uh, it's something to right. think about. Like, I like the concepts for people to take into uh, their, and, you know, we have a lot of creative people in this industry that can, you know, figure out right. ways to do some different things. So, um, well, there's going to be gyms soon that focus on um, environmental uh, training as well as a vital part of any athletic routine, because, you know, you can build your muscles and you can get really jacked and all that stuff. But if you can't stand, you know, uh, a 50 degree room for 30 minutes, um, there's something wrong, right? Yeah. You know, you like, I, I like to say that there's three pillars of human health and we know about diet and exercise. We talk about diet and exercise all the time, but what about the environment? What is the environment always doing to you that you're not realizing? And the way you train that is you go into um, you, you go to environments that are a little extreme, and then you train yourself that way. And it's it really is. I, I and I'm already seeing this all over the place. Um, uh, gyms with ice baths, gyms with um, saunas, gyms with various ways to work on that third pillar. And that's it's a great thing to see. Yeah, there's a gym in New York City. There's so many boutique gyms now that it's basically you're working out in the cold. So burn. Yeah, good big shout out called, to the guys. Called burn. burn. Okay. Yeah. B R R R N, and it's right near. I think it's near Union it Square. Is near Union no, it's Square, right. Yeah. It's, it, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. Check them out. They're great. It's cool. Um, well, this the wedge was such uh, an amazing journey of of your journey throughout the world and these different <laughs> different ideas. It was really cool. It was a lot of fun. And I think what I really like too is is your idea about how much you know, it is open to different interpretations and, and th this isn't the be all end all what you picked. You're talking about finding those wedges and there's a lot of different right. wedges. And uh, so uh, great job with the wedge, Scott. Thank you so much. And, you know, I'd encourage, and, you know, there's going to be audiobooks and there's going to be print books and eBooks and all that stuff. And just go to my website and you can get a um, sample chapter for free. And, uh, and then, you know, you'll buy the book and then you'll, you'll, you'll do awesome shit all around the world. It'd be great. So yeah, my website's scottcarney.com. Cool. We'll have links to that on the, uh, on the show notes. So thanks, Scott. Thanks again for, uh, for doing this. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. That's going to do it for episode 280 of the Strength Coach Podcast. Remember, you can try strengthcoach.com out for 30 days for just a buck. We extended the trial. You'll have access to all the articles, videos, and programs, as well as the best forum on the net. 
It's the only place to have full access to Coach Boyle. He's on every single day. To access that offer, go to strengthcoach.com. Click the Join Now button to get started on your trial. Special thanks to Chris Parrier and the folks over at Perform Better. Remember, free shipping on orders over $49, and they can create custom packages to help you fit your online training for your clients. Check it out at performbetter.com. Thanks to Coach Boyle and Scott Carney for sharing their insights and philosophies into the world of strength, conditioning, and performance enhancement. Thanks to Adam Doughty and Tim Robinson and Train Heroic. Head over to trainheroic.com to start your free 14-day trial. Remember, they got packages starting now at as low as $10 a month. Thanks to Alan Cosgrove and the Results Fitness University Business of Fitness segment. Check them out at resultsfitnessuniversity.com. Gray Cook and Functional Movement Systems. Check them out at functionalmovement.com. My name is Anthony Renner. My new book, Be Like the Best, consists of 50 interviews with top fitness professionals. And after each interview is a be like, an action step or a challenge that will help you be like the best. I understand people are having a hard time right now with the all the layoffs and the shutdowns. So if you want to borrow the book, we have a plan in place, borrow it for two weeks digitally. So shoot me an email to be like the best at gmail.com with the title borrow in the heading. That's going to do it for this episode. Thanks for listening. And I'll speak to you next time.